people walk around in the room. assistant, your mirror can be judging you as well. Connected devices are entering our homes in ways that are personal and are deeply private. They collect data about us at incredibly private moments, and we're asked to trust these machine learning opaque things with that data. Because do you know what Google does with the data from the home device? Amazon, or L'Oreal for that matter. And is it worth trusting? What might happen? The question that we're asking is who is responsible for ensuring that these connected devices that we allow into our lives behave ethically? It's a big question. Is it the government? Is it the people that create these devices? Is it us? Can we actually ensure that this happens in ways that doesn't harm or at least doesn't humiliate us? Really, there's no playbook. There's no rules of conduct right now. Technology de developers and designers at both large companies and those working to disrupt and to innovate, entrepreneurs, makers, hackers, they're charged with making 
moral choices, and they're expected to get it right. Whatever right is. The European Union General Data Protection Regulation has set out a number of guidelines that each me member country has a complicated web of laws and policies for what might be done to personal data and how it might be managed. But as we all know, laws are complex. And even more is having trouble navigating these deep waters. How can we expect developers and designers to do so as well? So then the question is, right now, before I go and talk about ethics, if ethics is talked about, and a lot of concerns about privacy and ethics are considered post hoc, kind of bolted on at the end. Oh, right, we shouldn't be collecting this data, or we should be asking consent for this. And with this project, we want to change this. So this is the project. We propose that we want to change how ethics is considered in the process of designing technologies for the Internet of Things. The project is funded by the EU Horizon 2020, the Research and Innovation Program, and I have now fulfilled the uh, part of the agreement with the EU for mentioning every time this project is mentioned, which program funded it, and the fact that it's funded by the EU. Moving right along. All right, so what it is that we're going to do? Virtual analyze and map the ethical practices of European hardware and software entrepreneurs, maker and hacker spaces, and community innovators. Because actually, we don't know what these are. We're going to, we're hoping to achieve three goals. One, simply is an understanding. How are team innovators enact ethics in the design of future devices? Because if we're going to try for a better future with devices that treat our data ethically, we best think about and talk to the people that are designing that future. We also want to generate a new framework that takes into account both ethics and social impact alongside privacy and personal data protection. Right now, impact assessments are only concerned with data protection and privacy. But we want to go beyond that, and we believe that is important. And finally, while the first two are perhaps academic and policy goals, this final one is the one that perhaps will help us change things. We want to develop tools to support ethical reflection and self-assessment as part of the design and development process. For that, we need to figure out what this design and development process looks like, and then figure out if there are ways to change it. We're working on a fundamental assumption. The reason why we think this is possible is because we assume that when designers of technologies talk to each other, debate, disagree about what tools to use, to manage and respond to data, to manage and respond to users, that they are actually negotiating and enacting ethics. That's what we all do every day. We're enacting ethics. We make decisions, and some part of us is part of deciding whether what we're doing is fitting with a code of conduct, our internal barometer of right and wrong. And that's what ethics is, is an internal barometer of right and wrong. And about on that assumption, we think that by understanding what these ethical assumptions are, we can then figure out if there's ways to use reflection, to use thinking about futures, to use speculation to adjust, to change, or to shift some of these ethical concerns. Whether or not it is possible, we'll find out. But to do this, we needed to get people from very different backgrounds to work together, and to truly work together. This project has Researchers from anthropology, human-computer interaction, data mining, computer science, law, media studies, design. And we're not just doing our computer science, design, ethnography. In order for uh, any of us to get done what we promised, we have to work together. So while I have here listed different kinds of approaches, we have to figure out how to put them 
put together. Like this. Hopefully. In neat circles. But really, it'll take us three years, and hopefully by the end of three years, we'll get here to the tool set. A tool set that could potentially be useful um, by the communities of designers, makers, and hackers that think about hardware and software and the internet of things. And perhaps use it a little more broadly. But it will take some basic research, it will take some applied research, and it will take some design. And while this is all very neat, I'm sure it'll get messy and iterative, and we'll fail a bunch of times before we succeed. So we're looking forward to it. <coughs> Let me tell you a little bit about who we are. We have six partners in this project. This project is coordinated by the IT University of Copenhagen. The IT University of Copenhagen has three faculty and two PhD students that will be part of this project. We are joined by the London School of Economics um, and Political Science. We're joined by Upsal University. We'll take the to Reno and the Nexus Center for Internet and Society, the Open Rights Group, as well as the Copenhagen Institute of Interaction Design. And all of these people are coming together to do something fairly unusual that we're really excited about. We're going to try and see if we can make ethics an actionable process. If we can actually somehow intervene and affect how technology is built. We'll find out. So to launch this, to kick this off, I've asked three of our partners to come and talk to us, asking three questions. First, Alison Powell will talk to us how should we respond to the dilemmas of connected life. Our lives are connected, it's undeniable. So what are we going to do about it? Then Alessandra Montalera will talk to us about how can we take into account the ethical and social impact in the use of personal data from a legal perspective. And finally, Annalie Berger will ask what is the role of design in generating a conversation about ethics among developers? How are we going to do that? And with that, I'm going to open the floor to our talks. Thank you. And thank you. I'm so delighted to be here. Um, my name is Alison Powell, and I'm the, an assistant professor in the Department of Media and Communication at the London School of Economics, where I lead a program called Data and Society, which um, comprises a master's degree uh, in social science that focuses on data and society, and also um, that involves a research group, a growing research group, um, that's concerned with some of the issues that are kind of the consequences of the increasing datification of our everyday experience. So today I'm going to give you a bit of a kind of um, broad social perspective on some of the concerns that to me underpin the project of the virtue um, en uh, endeavor. And I don't know if Irina um, mentioned this to any of you, but this is a three-year We've also spent three years trying to get the funding. So in a sense, it's a six-year project. It's a major intellectual endeavor that has already been unfolding over time. And um, I think it touches on some of the things that are central to my own research, but that might also drive the things that you care about in your world. And one of the th questions that I kind of start with is the question of why does this matter? So why do we care that algorithms make decisions or that social media platforms um, hold all of our data and then use it to market to us? Why do we care that our Alexa-connected devices might be overhearing what we're saying? There was one response that says, well, I don't really care at all. But actually, people do care. And people care enough that the discussions about the consequences of connected life are expanding and unfolding and driving projects like ours. 
And so my answer is that when we give up our data, we are not giving up our data to the cloud. We're giving up our data to some very specific kinds of intermediaries. And these intermediaries structure our ability to speak, listen, and be heard on issues that matter to us. And I'm a communication scholar. It's really important to me how people are able to speak, how people are able to influence their world and act upon it. And so these are very primal and, and primary concerns for me. So technical systems as well as social structures have always influenced this capacity that people have to speak, listen, and to be heard, to have voice, to be able to act. But I think something has changed fundamentally. In the last 20 years, we've seen a movement away from an interest in expanding citizen rights to gain access to communication technologies and towards a kind of structuring of our experience in terms of what data we produce. And this underpins the sort of transformation of the internet as a technology of access and connectivity into the internet of things as a technology of data absorption, analysis, and management. So I think we are in a, in a very um, interesting moment in terms of constructing um, what might be a new set of frames for citizenship. Because these technologies of datafication, that is transforming more and more of life into data, to make everyday acts into streams of data and make those data available through platforms. This creates new dynamics, new relationships, and they have a significant impact on how we're able to speak and listen and be heard. And one of the things I'm interested in is how we act about things that matter to us collectively. So how we might think about our capacity to be citizens, even good citizens, if you like, um, not in the sense of citizens as um, having a passport of a particular country, but citizens as people who act in places that they live, places they care about, and contexts where they think what they do matters. And we can see that the Internet of Things sensor technologies give us a good way of perhaps being able to influence civic conversations, for example, about air pollution. Um, and I know many people here at ITU have done projects that have involved citizen sensing networks, expanding the ability of sensing technologies to spread out into the world and to, to, to create a conversation based on data. We also have technologies um, that allow us to report things that we observe and um, send that information back to governments. Um, and so these are all different ways that citizenship um, can be enhanced or changed or shifted by the expansion of data collecting, managing, and sharing technologies. But these also create really significant dilemmas. And the dilemmas have to do with moving from this idea of the internet as a platform for communication to the internet of things as a platform for data collection um, analysis. And data processing also raises some very significant ethical questions that have to do with the consent that we ap apply to any data that is collected. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how data processing, proce uh, data processing means that some of the principles of consent are very difficult to apply, creating kind of legal and normative problems that, we, um, that are associated with the expansion of the um, Internet of Things. But there are also um, changes in the ways that we position ourselves as ethical subjects um, within this shift towards data citizenship. We, might, we have a lot of personal responsibility for the data that we produce, but we have no power to actually limit that data, or in fact, to, to control very effectively where it moves away from us. So these are some of these um, initial dilemmas. And I'm going to talk through the first dilemma, which is the dilemma that is just relating to the movement uh, from the internet as a platform for communication to the internet of things as a data intensive technology. Then I'm going to talk very briefly about some of the ethical issues, um, and I think Alessandro is going to talk more specifically about those. 
And then finally, I'm going to um, briefly outline some possible responses that we might have. And the responses are the place where you will then hear me talk again about ethics. What I'm trying to do in this talk is explain to you about why I care about data ethics. And I care about data ethics because of these dilemmas of citizenship. So what I've noticed is that it's possible to see a shift in ways of talking about and building support for citizenship that moves from thinking about citizenship as related to access to a network towards citizenship as a kind of production of data. And my example here is to think a little bit about how governments describe what they expect from their citizens. Um, and I have two um, images on this slide. And they're separated by 15 years. And the first one is a Government of Canada um, uh, sort of policy slide talking about the ways that the Government of Canada invested in expanding access to the internet as an essential communications infrastructure. And in the early 2000s, and many of you are not old enough to remember this, but I've been doing this for a long time, so I remember, the information society was on the ascendant. There was a notion that we were going to become a more effective civilization and a more effective society by increasing access to information. And increasing access to information essentially meant expanding access to the internet and expanding the number of computers that could create information that would become accessible on the internet. <coughs> So throughout the 1990s and into the early 2000s, these policy processes um, collided with the expansion of the IT industry and created a great business opportunity for a lot of companies to get in to this policy space and be the access providers. And um, for example, Cisco Systems um, provided lots of technologies to support these um, policy processes like the expansion of school net community access and the expansion of government information online. So we had on the one hand a kind of vision of a better society as a society with increased access to information, and on the other hand an, expansion, an expanded role for large IT companies in delivering their business, their, their, uh, their business in relation to this policy project. Fast forward 15 years, and we look at the right hand of the slide, and now we have the same IT companies promising not access to information, but a smart interconnected grid that absorbs data produced by citizens to allow for the optimization of government provided services. So no longer is the kind of framework for this being about citizenship as getting access to information and being able to participate in a network of relationships. It is now much more about individuals being um, able to produce data that can then be taken up by a decision-making entity and used to optimize service delivery. So recently I did some empirical work to actually map out um, how the large technology companies are positioning what they are providing to, um, to, to governments. And there were sort of three main areas. Um, I analyzed 100 different smart city um, uh, service provision companies to see what they were trying to sell to cities. Um, and I discovered that they um, largely broke down to be um, products that would provide data analytics, data aggregation, and real-time monitoring. And so all of these are technologies of optimization, which means that they are predicated on the city government needing access to lots of data and needing to be able to optimize something about the function of their government. This is not about providing access to the data to the citizens. It's much more um, about providing a more optimal view of what the citizens are producing in terms of their data. And Optimization, of course, depends on effective prediction, which means that um, there's a very important space for intermediaries to develop predictive or risk management strategies. And so 
this is interesting, and I think this, um, if, uh, as you're in an IT university, none of this is news to you. But from a social science perspective, this raises some really interesting questions. And the questions are around when a main framework for your civic life is in relation to optimization, some things are going to be easier to fit in than others. Some things are going to be easier to optimize than others. And furthermore, if your optimization depends upon people sharing data all the time, what happens to these bigger ethical questions? So this is a framework that I developed that kind of maps out some of the ethical problems with a, with the op with a kind of uh, a, a full optimization perspective. This is a framework that sketches out how data is used within an Internet of Things paradigm. And so we're, we, we, I've, I've tried to sketch out how different kinds of intermediaries are required to actually make this data useful, and how these intermediaries actually do have quite a lot of power in defining what is good data, what is bad data, and in fact, what, is, what the action of a good citizen is. So we think maybe a good citizen used to be somebody who you know, voted or was informed or participated in public debate. A lot of these, pr these processes imply that a good citizen is a citizen that produces a lot of data. So what are the processes of, um, of, of you know, broadly conceived that um, map out in relation to Internet of Things data gathering and decision making? So first you have to acquire data. And that's done in many different ways. It can be done through large-scale sensors, um, like traffic management cameras. It can be done through ci um, citizen science installations that are trying to acquire data to, to create a public conversation about air pollution, for example. It can be done by all kinds of um, personal technologies, um, like the one that I have a photograph of here, um, uh, fitness trackers. Um, one of my computer science friends um, has proposed a fake technology called the Ambient Loo that just collects all kinds of ambient information about using the toilet. So we could even have sort of hypothetical design futures um, locations for acquisition of data. And of course, the Ambient Loo could optimize all kinds of things that we have not yet thought of optimizing. Consider that. So acquisition is only the first step. Then you have data aggregation, analytics, and action. And the implication here from existing frameworks for privacy is that we should have kind of control of our own personal data. But in reality, that breaks down right after the first step. In order to make any decision based on large-scale aggregated data, you have already gone beyond the, 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 the boundary of personal data. And some of the issues related to the Internet of Things um, th that include and go beyond these kind of civic questions that I've raised have to do with how you know um, how much of this process could potentially be under personal control. Not much of it is, in fact, under personal control. So. Um, the analytics um, of transport data, for example, are based on large-scale aggregations of transport data. And you can see patterns in people's commuting, and you can see um, uh, uh, sort of uh, large-scale movements over time. Um, but it is actually possible to de-anonymize data and to find out things about individual people. Uh, and so there, the, so there are these uh, very... Um, problematic dilemmas about individual responsibility versus collective responsibility, about the, the value that is derived from aggregating data versus the ethical frameworks that imply that the um, point of consent needs to be the individual. So the metaphor of the cloud um, breaks down because action, for example, may be difficult to undertake with partial data. Um, so the relationships between the responsibilities in each, uh, that, that are um, outlined at each of these levels can be controlled through design and also through standardization and law. Um, and so this kind of um, framework of um, 
uh, of the, uh, the unfolding levels of analysis of Internet of Things data also sketches a number of places and relationships where our dilemmas of responsibility collide with, our, uh, with the dilemmas raised by, the dat by datification as a form of citizenship. So if we're, if we're expected to be acting as ideal data citizens by sharing our data, um, should the acquisition always um, be accompanied by our explicit consent? If our explicit consent means that no real action can be taken, if the aggregation Depend, creates um, profiles of communities, for example, that have particular protected qualities, um, does that mean that we cannot, can no longer take um, action based on this data? So there are a number of potential responses to this. Um, and in the final section of this talk, I want to present some possible ways to address these dilemmas of connected experience. Um, and I'm going to go rather quickly through most of them and focus on the final one, which is the ethical. Um, so the first of these questions, um, which has to do with thinking, about, thinking through the consequences of the responsibility, particularly in automated decision making, is a normative one. So there have been recently attempts at regularizing the processes of, the compu of computational or algorithmic processes that underpin the transformation of data, that take action um, at trying to bring a kind of um, normative oversight to the analytics level, not to the collection level, not to prevent the collection of data, um, because it is now well, well understood that the collection of data may happen in places where consent cannot um, legitimately be given, and that the analytics of data may create situations in which discrimination occurs in ways that cannot be well described by the designer of the system. So computer science colleagues, including um, Joshua Kroll, who I've had um, some very interesting um, uh, debates with over the past couple of years, have produced um, a kind of strategy for identifying um, places um, and, and, uh, and modes of, of ensuring procedural regularity of algorithms as a means of making algorithmic systems accountable so that we can push the, um, the, ass the assessment of this chain of analysis um, up into a level beyond the personal. Um, the second set of responses um, are legal and institutional, um, and these include both the kinds of responses that Alessandro will talk about in his talk just following mine, but also um, institutions and organizations that are seeking to, um, to uh, create different modes of institutional action to address these the, uh, the, um, the dilemmas that are currently raised by the role of intermediaries that I sketched. Now, if, let's say, the smart city intermediaries that I described were not companies with their own data ethics policies, with their own perhaps very bad data sharing practices, but in fact public institutions, their accountability might be differently located. And so this is behind a number of strategies to try and address um, accountability in relation to data aggregation at the civic level. And there's quite a lot of work being done in the city of Barcelona, for example, um, on what they're calling a new deal for data. Um, there are also a number of small organizations that are trying to act as data brokers in the public interest. And these include um, proposals for data co-ops, um, some data co-ops will let you set a price for your own personal data, and some proposals for data co-ops are about collectively doing the, bro the brokerage that I talked about earlier. So instead of delegating the responsibility for determining how to optimize your data to companies who then sell the data and their optimizing technologies back to governments, the data co-ops are proposing that people self-organize for this. And finally, there are um, increasingly um, uh, sort of new ways of thinking about the instruments of regulation. I'll leave that to Alessandra to talk about. I think also, however, there, are so, there is a very important place for critical responses to all of this that dig in to how we think about data 
and how we think about this process of datification uh, in relation to our citizenship. And here's where the ethics comes back in. Because we can think about this process in terms of its outcomes, or we can think about this process in terms of how it is designed. And one of the, th the ways th that we have been um, working on this within the Virtue Project is not only to think about the outcomes for citizens, but to think about the, the, the process through which these technologies and processes get designed. And we, we have this radical idea that people who build these processes are not trying to be horrible. We think that people are actually just trying, to, they are trying to do a number of things, but they are likely not trying to be horrible. So we've been experimenting with the idea of virtue ethics. Um, and Sigmund Bauman, who I, I, many of you may know, who is a, Pol a Polish sociologist and who passed away this week, um, argued that the conditions of modernity make it impossible for individuals to act ethically. This was one of his big claims. And the, the sort of project of virtue ethics follows on from this assumption. Bauman said that the structures of modernity, which separate individuals from each other and create social relations of differential power and obedience to structure, make it really difficult to conceive of true collective ethical projects. So instead of thinking, how can I do a really good ethical contribution to the Internet of Things, people think about how to do their job effectively, even though they know that it's putting into practice this unfolding of um, unfortunate and perhaps unethical relationships. And so this makes people feel simultaneously guilty and powerless to change the structures. And within the data-enabled technology design realm, these dynamics play out in the way that individual users are constantly heckled by tech companies and advocates to protect their personal data, right at the bottom of my diagram, acquisition. Oh no, should I like uh, uh, should I tell my Fitbit that it can collect my data? Well, if I do, if I if I don't let it go into the cloud, then I can't compare with my past, and nobody I can't compare with my friends, and so and we're constantly bombarded as individuals with this notion that we should protect our personal data while simu simultaneously being subject to industrial models that are predicated on that co same constant access to data, same limitation of choice, and the same exploitation of big data that happens in ways that ca can't take account of the impact on people. So I think that the ethical constraints of modernity that Bauman identified maybe should inspire us to rethink our ethical positions. So I want to kind of advocate for a re-examination of the principles of virtue ethics. So virtue ethics is concerned with the process of becoming able to act ethically and to display virtues, whatever those virtues might be. The virtue ethics literature has listed some, but I'm a bit radical. I think there might be others. I think they might come from the people who are actually doing things in the world. But central to the idea of virtue ethics is an idea of a good society. And that a good society has some virtues, some good things connected with it. So you shouldn't mistake this project for me calling that for a kind of like ideal state of human affairs. Look, we're going to open up the windows, the sun will shine in, we will all become virtuous. No, 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 I'm not asking for you to agree with the things that I think are virtuous. The way I interpret the project of virtue ethics and technology is to propose a means to interrogate how and in which ways we might identify and put into practice some of the qualities that are essential for human flourishing. And this is what philosophers talk about all the time, human flourishing. A good society, there, there are likely things that we can agree on that we consider to be foundational for a good society. And I think that most people can identify some of these, and that I also think that people practice some virtues every day. And they're not necessarily enacted smoothly. We don't become anything with ease, whether enlightened or virtuous. The true project is in the becoming. 
And I, that's what we really would like to examine. So following on from this kind of invitation, not only to think about the institutional responses to the problems of data, not only to think about the normative responses of the problems of data, but to think as well, critically, I'd like to advocate for considering how we might want to allow people to understand themselves as being able to enact ethics, even in the places and times when they don't think that they are, like at work when you're just trying to get your job done, or in your relationships um, with the other people that you see every day. So I also think, so I think we should do this as a means to strive for a social transformation. Why not? To create a world where the consequences of one's actions create a difference. I want to get past what Bauman identified as the impossibility of acting ethically under modernity by both looking at what we do in our everyday practice as potentially ethical and also striving to transform the world as we currently live in it. So the ethical subject who's thinking about his or her decisions and personally responsible for being ethical may never appear in this project. And I think we will probably see virtues as things that just kind of come together out of collaborative practice. And I am also not totally sure that we're ever going to achieve any of the things that I've listed as what I would like to achieve, but I I'm looking forward to addressing this formidable challenge as part of the Virtue Project and with the rest of the Virtue team. Um, and finally, I'd like to invite you all to consider in your own work and your own practice and your own lives how to address the dilemmas of connected experience. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We have a few minutes for questions. If you have any questions, please raise your hand. In the meantime, we'll prepare for the next talk. Thank you for staying for the design. Yeah. Uh, that was uh, very interesting. Uh, I was just wondering, maybe not just you, but also some of the other uh, party members. Could you elaborate on the kinds of ethical, political, data and kind of questions that are going to be the object of your analysis. How, how does this explanation um, relate to the fact that you're also going to use data yourself? That's a really interesting and, question. And what was mentioned about that you are, it sounded as um, uh, efficient when it was introduced that you're going to collaborate and you have to collaborate. So I was just wondering, are you going to collaborate about very different kinds of data? And this collaboration, will that collaboration in itself not entails some of the very same problems and, and uh, issues that you're actually out there to investigate. That's a fantastic question. We spent quite a lot of time discussing it this morning, in fact, um, because you're absolutely right. Any, any research project, especially one that involves collaboration, um, does involve the collection of data. And in this case, we have several different kinds of data that we're collecting. We're interested in what people do in their everyday practice. And we're interested in IoT communities of practice. So that means, um, as Irina said, people working in, um, in startups, people working in SMEs that do connected devices, um, but also people who are just simply kind of interested and in working around on Internet of Things issues, but not necessarily in an organization. Um, so practically, that means um, uh, hanging out, going to meetups, going to places where people are doing things, um, listening, um, watching, and collecting data, um, interviewing people, taking photographs, taking videos. So that's one set. Then there's a whole other discussion that unfolds online, because if anyone in this room is a developer knows that you don't just talk about your stuff when you run into people at an IoT meetup. You also commit on GitHub and you, and you know, go and search for something on the Arduino forum that has to do with a particular kind of product or a particular application. So that's also data for us, in a way. Um, and there's another side of the project that's really interested in looking at the relationships um, between the people who are talking about these kinds of things. Um, so we can't solve the problem. Like, we are in the dilemma. Um, and so part of the reason, you know, to, to lay out the, um, the kind of 
really big ethical questions in this way is to make the frame big enough that we're also in it. Because I don't think you can stand outside and go, over oh, there, y'all. You're making dilemmas. We're not. OK, there are different questions that are posed at the beginning of this uh, um, presentation. And uh, I tried to describe the situation in which this question has been placed. Um, my background is a legal background. I focus on data protection in uh, the last uh, 15, 20 years. And uh, in the virtual project, there is a specific uh, uh, section on the legal issues that have been already mentioned in the previous uh, um, presentation. There are different kinds uh, of issues. One is, uh, as described by Alison, this uh, dimension that is no longer individual, but is uh, a, a super individual uh, dimension, is a collective dimension, because the data are used to represent society, to represent a group of people, and not necessary to represent each single individual. And this is different from the traditional approach that uh, we have uh, in uh, data protection that is mainly an individual right based on the idea that there is a person as a specific right that uh, is about uh, is a personal information. Another topic is about the consent and I briefly mentioned in the presentation the consent and the limits of the consent as a traditional way to manage and collect personal information. But the core of the project from a data protection perspective is the impact assessment, is the analysis of the risk. In this sense, this presentation is mainly on, okay, is mainly on the risk. The risk, in, term, in general terms, uh, is uh, a, an element that uh, was present s since the origin in uh, the data protection regulation because the data protection regulation are based on the fact that uh, information are collected and mainly during the 60s and the 70s this extensive for that time collection of information creates some concern about the risk of social surveillance uh, and lead uh, regulators to create uh, some sort of protection, some sort of uh, safeguards for citizens. This is the origin of uh, data protection regulation and in its origin there is this idea of risk. Risk of a negative impact on individuals and risk of a negative impact on society. In order to address this risk, the regulation adopt an approach that was uh, the consequence of being written by lawyers and computer scientists. So an approach that is a sort of procedural approach. The traditional approach in law is based on the fact that there is a, a specific request by the law, you have to do that or you have not to do that, and a potential sanction. But uh, if you infringe the law, the, the, the reaction is the sanction. In data protection regulation, we try to do something different. We try to create a process that adopts a specific design in order to be, by design, compliant, in order to put in the way in which you collect and use data some specific safeguards in order to limit the potential risks related to the use of data. This was the idea. For this reason, the focus was on the procedure, on the way in which you collect, manage, use, reuse, share, distribute personal information. In this sense, when we talk about risk, we have to consider two different notions of risk. There is a broader notion of risk, in which risk is considered any kind of negative impacts, negative consequences for individuals. And in this sense of risk, the existing legal framework creates a sort of paradox that is known as constant paradox. Because there is a risk 
in the way in which your information are collected, for instance, by social media, because they use this information to profile you, uh, are collected by e-commerce provider because are used to adopt strategy of price discrimination that in many cases are not positive for you and so on. So there are many potential risks. There are also well-known cases, Airbnb and so on. All these risks are partially excluded by the fact that from the legal perspective, we use an instrument that is the notice and consent. So you are informed about the use of your personal information and that you accept the use of this personal information by the data controller, by the, uh, the entity that collects and uses this information. And so if uh, there is a long list of potential use of information and you don't usually read this long list, you accept and then this information are broadly used without any illegal treatment of personal information. This is the paradox of the consent. The consent was created in uh, the 80s and the 90s in order to provide the control. And we maintain this idea also in the new regulation recently adopted by the European Union about the individual self-determination, the individual control over personal information that also from the theoretical perspective as a long history. But uh, the problem is that this control in the past was possible, now it's very difficult. Because now we are not able to realize in which way our information are used, for which purpose. The purpose continuously change. Some, uh, someone talked about the transformative use of personal information. So it's very difficult to maintain this idea that you control information because you are informed and you accept something that you never read or if you read, you are not able to understand in many cases. But there is also another notion of risk. It's a narrow notion of risk in, in terms of prejudice to individual rights and uh, freedoms. And this is the notion of the GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, the new legal framework adopted by the European Union. And uh, when we consider this notion, there is a list of cases in uh, the regulation that uh, show the different potential risks for individual rights and freedom. And it's important that in this list is also mentioned any other significant economic or social disadvantage. Because the, the main problem of this approach to, in data protection to risk is that the traditional approach is mainly focused on the security of personal information, the access and misuse of personal information, but there is only in the, the decision of data protection authorities sometimes attention for the social and the ethical impact of of the use of personal information. But in the text of the laws, the national laws, and also in the regulation, this aspect of the ethical and social uh, impact is considered as something different from the main legal issues. The GDPR is an important regulation because it creates a uniform framework. Right now we have different national regulation in the new G uh, context described by the GDPR. We have only one general data protection regulation. And uh, this uniform approach is adopted also in managing the risk. And in managing the risk, the GDPR adopts a model that uh, is called as rights-based approach or mitigation risk approach that is different from, the, from another approach that is a, a more known in the US, is the arm-based approach. So in Europe, we have to remember that the personal information are mainly part of individual personality, are protect our personal rights. And from this perspective, due to the fact that we have a sort of hierarchy between the different rights, this rights cannot be negotiated, freely negotiated or bargaining with other kinds of benefits. 
So the risk-based approach is based on the idea that we have to protect individual rights and uh, there are some activities that can introduce risk for individual rights. The arm-based approach is based on the fact that when you use your personal information, there is a sort of trade-off between benefits and costs. And benefits and costs can be heterogeneous. So you can share your personality rights and obtain in exchange manner or other kinds of benefit. So the benefits and the costs are on the same, at the same level. There is not a hierarchy. For this reason, in, uh, the, from the European perspective, we adopted the risk-based approach. So we move from the idea that the protection of personal information is fundamental, is a fundamental right, and cannot be managed through a general forms of risk-benefit assessment. In this sense, the assessment that is adopted in general data protection regulation is based on three different steps. The first step is a general assessment about the potential risk. If you realize that there is a potential risk, you have to make a specific procedure that is called data protection impact assessment, require a traditional form of a risk assessment based on the analysis of the risk and uh, the assessment of the risk and the adoption of the measure. The problem is that uh, this description of the impact assessment is not so clear because there are some notions that are used in this assessment. For instance, we talk about high risk and it's, it's, it's difficult to define what is an high risk. This is the provision, is that there is a high risk. There is a list in the regulation of uh, the cases that uh, potentially create high risk, but the list is open, so data protection authority can add other hypotheses and can also cre create hypotheses in which the risk is excluded. But this approach is strange, because when we talk about risk, we talk about something that is not, don't, we don't know. We have to assess the risk. So it's difficult to have a list of high risk, low risk, medium risk, if you have not assessed the risk. You cannot say that by default some kind of data processing are necessary high risk. It depends, in some cases, in the way in which you realize this specific kind of uh, data processing. Moreover, there are some notions like large-scale data, uh, data collection that is, are unknown. What is a large scale? In the, the definition of a large scale, there are some words about a considerable amounts. What is con a considerable amounts of data? There are reference to territorial collection, but data are no longer collected on a territorial basis. So these are the limits uh, that uh, there are in uh, the risk assessment. If the risk is a high risk, and if there are no measures to mitigate, to reduce the risk, the data controller should to ask to the supervision, to data protection authority, supervision authority, to give advice. And the data, pro uh, data protection authority give advice in order to say which kind of solution can be adopted in order to reduce the risk, or if the risk cannot be reduced, the Data Protection Authority can limit the use of personal information. This is the framework. The framework has some limits that I have already mentioned. Another limit is that it is based on the purpose, because all the framework of the risk is related to the purpose for data processing. But the purpose, according to the data protection regulation, are defined in the moment in which you collect information. So when you collect information, you define the purpose for the data uses, and you assess the risk on, ba on the basis of this purpose. But the problem is that we have a sort of transformative use of data. So we collect data for a specific purpose, but then we decide that, that uh, using algorithms, these kinds of data tell us something different and uh, we can use this information for another purpose. 
So the purpose can change frequently, again and again. And how you can assess the risk on the basis of a purpose that is not defined and that you should define at the moment in which you collect information. This is the limit. So we suggest a different approach, moving from the purpose to the uses. The purpose is something that usually is very general at the beginning. The uses is something that is more specific, that you know in the moment in which you decide to exploit a specific information. You decide to use a specific information. You collect an information, and then there are different kind of uses. When you decide to opt for one user or another, in that moment you have to assess the specific risk for this kind of use. And then we want to move from data protection impact assessment, or already known privacy impact assessment, to privacy ethical and social impact assessment. Because as I tried to briefly describe, all this system of risk assessment is mainly based on an idea of risk that is very circumscribed to the individual dimension and is circumscribed to the protection of the data in terms of not have an access, not have a wrongful use of data. But there are other aspects that are related to the collection of data, the use of data for decisional purpose that have an impact not only on individual but on collective in general. And in many cases, these data are not necessary personal data. For instance, if you consider the neighborhood credit scoring, is a measure of the credit scoring over a specific area that affects all the persons that live in that area, but it's not a personal data per se, because it's not referred to a specific individual. So the, the way in which we use the data is changing and is moving from the individual dimension to a higher level in the scale, in the dimension, and we try to map group, we try to map collective uh, entities and bodies. This is something of that in the new guideline that now we have draft, we are hope to approve this draft at the end of January of the Council of Europe. And there's a specific mention in the, uh, in the Council of Europe guidelines on big data on the, the ethical and social implication. This is important and it was difficult to introduce this because here there are many people that come from social science. But uh, if we give this presentation in front of different public from lawyers, the objection is but ethical aspects are already, are already in the law. If are not in the law, are not relevant. <laughs> and that's the problem that I address when I try to introduce this provision in the Council of Europe guidelines. So this presentation is not an answer to the question about what we will do in virtue, because this is the kickoff, so I don't know which is the final outcome. We see mm, in the next three years and <laughs> give you the answer. But uh, th I know what are the challenges. The challenges are the fact that we have to define the ethical and social main items. We have to define the guidelines from the ethical and social perspective. And this is very difficult. Because ethics and social are context-based, are different from one community to another. It's different from the uniform approach of general data protection regulation, because the data protection regulation is a law. It's the same for all the countries in Europe. If you consider not from the legal perspective, but from the ethical and social perspective, this perspective are necessary based on the different context. And we want to translate these guidelines in a tool, in a, an instrument to assess the privacy, ethical, and social impact assessment. So we had to focus on the context. We had to focus on the law, because the law is part of the context. But we had to focus also on the ethical and the social dimension. And to do that, we had to investigate the IoT communities, the different stakeholders that codify in an informal way their value in terms of social ethics. And also to compare, this is one of the topics of the project, this value that are recognized inside the communities with a legal framework to assess if are the same value, if there are differences, if they are conflicting, and so on. We have to investigate how low ethical and social values are 
conceptualized, understood, and adopted in these communities. But the final goal is to create a tool for the, public, for the um, privacy, ethical, and social impact assessment. And the assessment is the moment in which you realize that there is a problem, in which you realize that there is a potential risk, and in which you have to remove or mitigate this kind of risk. So the impact assessment enables stakeholders to be aware about the risk and the implication of their use of personal information. And for this reason, this kind of awareness cannot be limited, circumscribed only to the traditional privacy and data protection dimension, but to a broader vision, they should also consider a broader vision that can take into account the ethical and social dimension. The final step is if you assess something, then uh, like in the GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation uh, model of assessment, then you have to adopt a measure in order to mitigate the risk or reduce the risk. So this is uh, the strategy that we also adopt uh, with regard to the privacy, ethical and social impact assessment. We give, we want to give a tool to assess the risk and uh, on the basis of this assessment then developers had to adopt the, some measure, had to embed in the structure of their tools, not only data protection, but also the ethical and social issues that the impact assessment make clear and ask them to be active in contrasting the potential implication. That's the idea. We are the first step and uh, next three years we try to go into the taste uh, and uh, to try to figure out a different framework for the impact assessment that is different from the existing general data protection uh, impact assessment. So from the legal perspective, this is a theoretical work because the law is not still aware of this dimension about the ethical and the impact uh, and the social impact of user data. Thanks. And, and this is the topic of the ethical use. So the traditional argument that is used to, let me say, reduce the safeguard or the individual control over uh, uh, personal information is uh, the general interest. So you have to give uh, your healthcare information because this information is useful for the entire community. Um, there is not a specific answer from a legal perspective, but there is a method, a methodology. Uh, the, the methodology that we use in law is the balance of interest. So we assess the different interests and we decide that some interests can prevail over other interests. This was what I mentioned, the uh, risk-based or right-based approach. <laughs> For instance, if you go to the airport, in some airport, you have to pass through some controls that make a body scan. In order to have a balance of interest between security and individual data protection and privacy, 
This is an option. You can opt out. You can say, I don't want to use the body scan. And moreover, the body scan cannot be used, for instance, to assess to this room, but only in a specific case when there is an high risk in which there is a collective general interest that can prevail partially of individual rights. And this is not new. This is a traditional way in which the law address this kind of issue of balancing between individual and collective dimension. With regard to the big data use, IoT use, the problem is that in many cases this kind of balancing test is completely new, so we have to make this balancing test. In this sense, the impact assessment based on ethical and social dimension is a sort of answer. Because to make the assessment, you have to make the balance. So this is the instrument to have a balance that is broader. Because the balance right now is based on two rights. My rights over my personal information and the rights of the governor or the collective, or the collective interest, public interest, and so on. We want to have a broader vision in which the problem is not your rights, but the problem is the rights of the community, for instance. So yeah, I'm, I'm not, as a person, can be completely, I completely agree to the fact that uh, I want to give my information because I don't take care about the fact that there are uh, cameras in every place. But as a community, this is ethical or not? Because uh, the member of the community can be say every, every member can be, yes, you want to be monitored every day. But is ethical or not? The fact that uh, each individual agree with the model, it means that uh, necessary this model is ethical. Because if we use the traditional data protection model, this is the answer. If everyone agree, that's OK. There are only exceptions, for instance, in the labor sector in which there is a collective dimension of protection of uh, individual rights. So this is the different approach that we're trying to figure out. We're trying to move from the individual that in many cases cannot be aware, cannot be, and uh, is involved uh, indirectly in this uh, balancing test uh, through the instrument of consent, for instance. And the consent means that uh, you are to make the balancing of interest and you are not in the position in many cases. And we want to have a sort of ethical assessment, so involve a broader number of entities and stakeholders in order to assess which is the main interest in the individual and in the collective dimension. This, I don't know if the, the exact answer, but it's the idea that we have. First of all, thank you to Irina um, and everyone here at ITU for hosting us and for coming to this talk. Um, it's really great to see all of you, even though we don't know you yet. Um, and really inspiring talks by Allison and Alessandro. So that was a great way to start. Um, so I'm Annalie from CIAD, the Copenhagen Institute of Interaction Design. And um, our role in VERT EU is to translate the insight, insights that are gained by our amazing research team um, into practical tools and potentially interactive applications that will be relevant to developer communities um, through methods like co-design workshops and stakeholder workshops, as well as speculative design and iterative prototyping um, together with developers. So today, um, I'd like to kind of take a bit of a step back and talk about how little details become big in regards to design, ethics, and connected devices. Um, so I'll start with thinking through the role of design and gathering these three words together, um, and then look at a spectrum of illustrative examples that might help us think about um, speculative design in the context of ethics, um, and then end by wondering what next, and hopefully have some discussion with all of you about that. So perhaps when you see the two words, design and devices together, um, you think about the skin of IoT devices. So what, yeah, okay, 
chrome or white or mahogany uh, as your choices for the beautiful glowing orb that you're going to have in your living room. Um, or perhaps when you think about design and ethics together, you start to immediately think, especially in the context of today, about those checkboxes or the terms and conditions um, that you don't read. So I think that these elements are definitely part of the picture. Um, and they're the forward-facing user interfaces are absolutely crucial um, for us to understand what we can and cannot control in these applications. Um, but I think we should take a moment to reflect about what happens on the other side of the devices um, and the role of the developers as they create those initial bones, muscles, and the pulsing energy of the IoT devices. So here we can acknowledge, actually, the potential of unlocking more awareness and knowledge about ethical decision making from that first seed of the product design as opposed to all the way at the end where you might tack on your after the fact um, beautifully designed user interface, which is absolutely crucial also. But let's take a moment now today and think about the first seed and how do we, how do we take an ethical approach from the very first step. Um, so, as I was saying, um, how, do, how would developers actually decide in the first place what those seemingly little details of technical infrastructure within an IoT device are and how accessible they will be for users um, and how much control they think users should have or not? Um, are they entirely embedded inside of a product management process, which they can't even take a step outside of and question? Um, these are some of the initial first questions that we'll be considering when we go in and talk to and look at these developer communities, um, whether on online forums or in person. But then, once those details are chosen, how do they become potentially big details or even glaring holes, if we're not aware of their implications. Mm, I think that in the case of these developers and designers that we're thinking about, and I should say, I think that's many of us right here, standing or sitting in this room. Um, it's not just a kind of us and them, here I am and here they are kind of situation. So maybe I'll start saying we in the future. But um, sometimes it can be even difficult to start thinking about these ethical dimensions um, and to even have a toehold and wonder what the next toehold might be when we plot out what implications there are for the devices that we're designing. So what kind of tools um, could we create that might help designers and developers to get through that process and figure out what the implications are from step to step, toehold to toehold, as they make these apps or tools or devices? Um, how can we empower developers and set them up to think critically about what they're making? And I think that here's where we posit in EU that design has another role to play. Um, it's beyond the traditional approach of, let's say, just graphic design or product design from a kind of finalizing the concept point of view. Um, in this case, we're taking a turn down a branch of speculative design. Um, and we're going to try to create some artifacts and some situations and some experiences and workshops that will help participants think divergently and think differently about the future. Um, so we might build those out in current technology, but we will free ourselves a little bit from the constraints of 
let's say, the business requirements of a day-to-day um, of a day-to-day product as you were making them. And this diagram is from um, James Auger, and it's about alternative presence and speculative futures. So we have um, basically everyday life and, and real products available on the market in the center, but then we also have technologies which are further and further uh, advanced and farther from our here and now. And we have to think about how we might bring them down into our here and now, and what role they will have for our future. So at this point, I want to look at a couple of examples which either go from mm, wondering and making us think about our power in terms of collecting information, our awareness, um, in terms of both being developers or designers in this world. And then finally, some really direct takes on how ethics um, have a part in these devices. So this is the Transparency Grenade by Julian Oliver um, in 2014. And it's a tool for more corporate and governmental transparency to actively leak all the information at a private meeting um, by capturing the network traffic and audio at a given location, and then streaming it to a server where images, usernames, and voice are extracted and presented. So this, to me, raises questions like, yeah, given that we could, would we and should we? When we look at something like this, um, this is a series of posters called Think Privacy by Adam Harvey, done last year in 2015. And this one says, mind the cyber things, and then kind of underneath, devices connected to the internet may betray you. And artist Adam Harvey brings attention to issues around data, privacy, and surveillance. Um, specifically thinking in this case, do we maybe need to update our public safety announcements? Um, are cyber things as strong as machines? So he's hijacking a familiar aesthetic from um, the safety <coughs> caution signs that you might see around a workshop. And actually, he was seeing it around his workshop in his, uh, in his workspace. And he said this was great advice when placed next to a drill press. Um, but heavy machinery safety is no longer a daily concern for me, and privacy is. Another project by Adam Harvey back in 2010 called CV Dazzle, um, and it's a type of camouflage from computer vision. So it uses makeup to create bold patterning on your face that will break apart um, features that are expected by computer vision algorithms. And to me, this one begs the question of, yeah, what does it mean if we have to engage in self-defense against the devices that we ourselves are creating? Um, and what does the information asymmetry have in terms of implications for, for, the, yeah, for our daily lives and the grocery stores that we're passing through, let's say? And this leads me to more direct tools uh, about speculation. And this is called Speculative Supply by Charles Gideon, um, done just this past fall in 2016. And it's, it, in and of itself, actually, a bit of a speculation um, to create a text editor that would actively help you support thinking and writing about alternatives. Um, and Charlie's putting together a series of tools um, that will hopefully help anyone speculate about the future implications of whether uh, an event or a product. Um, can we support people to hypothesize and speculate about the directions events can take? And what tools might they need during that speculative thinking and writing and editing process? Um, in case we needed more help imagining while using Charlie's tool, let's say, um, there's this uh, speculative hacking kind of work being done. In this case, um, hacking smart guns. So many of you may have seen this already, but um, in this case, the hacker is changing the trajectory of the rifle's bullet 
uh, after it's been shot so that um, the bullet flies 2.5 feet to the left. Um, in the next example, we have um, hacking cars, and this is the Jeep Cherokee experiment. So um, Miller and Valsak were able to entirely command the Jeep's entertainment system, dashboard functions, steerings, brakes, and transmissions. And again, here I think that examples like these are more about hacking as a form of speculation as much as they are about yeah, giving feedback to companies or showing um, the rest of the world kind of this fear-mongering issue of you can do this, this is possible. It's also part of, for, our, for us right now, having, yeah, most of us already seen a lot of these type of scenarios. Um, how do we take this and then consider, yeah, what, how it makes you start to think? how it makes you start to speculate about what you are designing today. Um, this project goes even more into that same vein. So it's called Ethical Autonomous Vehicles by Mathieu Cherubini. And um, I don't think there's too much sound for it. It's OK. No, there's not sound for it. Yeah. But it shows how driverless cars might behave in a simulated environment when confronted with various ethical scenarios um, or dilemmas. And so each behavior of the um, cars corresponds to a certain behavior uh, setup as well as a certain ethical principle. And he begs the question, could you purchase a set of ethical values that would go with your smart car? Um, depending on your taste or religious beliefs. And he pushes us to really think about how autonomous vehicles will need to consider those complexities of moral and ethical reasoning, because they will be confronted with unpredictable situations that have a huge effect on your daily life. And this is already back in 2014. Um, so. Hopefully, he's gotten a job at some of these, uh, some of these autonomous car companies. And he also has done a, some incredible uh, heavy lifting in terms of creating these complex diagrams um, where he looks at um, things like, if, um, if I'm buying, let's say, purchasing the protector set of ethical guidelines, um, the car will focus on the safety of the driver and the passenger no matter what. And um, how, how might he translate that to the operating system within a car? Um, by the way, I have tweeted and I'll give you a, a link later to all these projects so you can take a more look at these diagrams because they're pretty amazing. Another project again by Mathieu is called Open Source Ethics for Autonomous Surgical Robots. And in this case, he wonders um, if a company man manufactured this uh, surgical robot, the, um, the software would probably be closed. But what if it were open source? Um, what if you could potentially define the way that autonomous surgical robot acts? based on your, um, let's say, religious values or um, however else you have made your ethical map of personal values. Um, so here we see what would happen if a um, Jehovah Witness uh, were confronted with the ethical autonomous uh, surgical robots. Um, so they refuse blood transmission. And the hackers, in this case, would develop a module on top of the software that would forbid the robot to um, perform that blood transfusion. And again, so here I think it's kind of a moment to take a step and say, all right, we know that smart cars and smart rifles and robots for surgery clearly confront us with you know, glaring ethical problems and life and death black and white situations. Um, but what about the kind of more murky moments um, of, let's say, the, the domestic environment, um, where you have your 
coffee machine connected to the internet. You have your body connected to the internet in some way or another. What are the different questions that it might bring up? What are the scenarios that you start to think about? Um, and Simone Redodengo writes really thoughtfully about this. So he says, what about the more mundane and insignificant objects of our everyday lives? Smart objects might also need to have moral capacities as they know too much about their surroundings to take a neutral stance. So um, yeah, with fields like home automation, ambient intelligence, um, objects of our daily lives will have access to so much data about us and the environment around us that they will also need to and be taking decisions on our, um, on our part. And this uh, next project, Ethical Objects, is a really fantastic exploration of this notion. So, no. Should play. Mm. Yeah. So it says religion, atheist, education, basic. Age, zero to 20. <coughs> Sex, both. Found in Kathmandu, Nepal, actually. Uh, one response. So answer one, focus on the thinner person and give them the fan. <coughs> because I do not really, oh, yeah, it's, it's tough. Because I do not really like fat people and I think that they should be punished, something like that. <laughs> this is live crowdsourced data decided by the Mechanical Turk worker. So I think that a project like this is just, I mean, it's it's pretty brutally opening up um, a lot of these questions that we're wondering about today and wondering about invert EU and wondering about um, in regards to how we can design our objects such that they might potentially enact ethics that we believe in um, or engage with ethics in general and ethical decision making. And it's a light, I mean, he, uh, he kept it kind of light in his own way in the shooting of the video, but it's a really tricky issue. And he also goes into um, this detailed diagramming like Mathieu did. They, this is a collaboration between the two of them, um, where he explains not only exactly how the algorithm works within the fan that decides who gets the air, um, but also by diagramming things so explicitly, he opens it up for us, again, to, to take that to the table as a tool, as we p potentially develop or design or work on some initial concepts about connected products. 
and the role that they will play in our domestic uh, lives or, yeah, potentially public lives as well. So again, yeah, what, what tools and experiences can we set up to empower developers and designers to think critically about their practice and about their innovations? Um, to imagine the, the bigness of each detail that they compose. And to what end? Um, so critical design and speculative design, as I'm sure many of you know, takes a lot of inspiration from science fiction. Um, and I think that a lot of the questions that we wonder about um, push, they push us and they push um, the objects around us in terms of the possible role they could play. So, dogs are smartphones. <laughs> and um, Neil Gaiman, the intentions of a tool are what it does. A hammer intends to strike, a vice intends to hold fast, a lever intends to lift. They are what it is made for. But sometimes a tool may have other uses that you don't know. Sometimes in doing what you intend, you also do what the knife intends without knowing. And I think that beyond these, some of the projects that I've shown you today, there's also kind of more simple and, you know, uh, just analog ways that we can illustrate and have conversations about these topics that are really difficult. So we could take, um, in this case, this is the Networks Land Project by Surya Matu and Ingrid Burrington. And they developed a set of curriculum for kindergartners to understand, better understand how computers connect to the Wi-Fi, connect to each other, connect to a router, connect to the physical infrastructure in our cities, um, and how at any one of those different connection points, data could or could not be accessed. Um, so if we have these physical objects on the table with us, and we have those videos that we were looking at just before, um, maybe we could start to have a conversation among extremely different experts and actors who all have valid voices to bring to the table. And um, I think that in Vert EU, we're definitely hoping to open outside of the traditional boundaries of each one of our fields whether design or ethics or privacy or law, um, and come together to create an environment with developers, with designers, to, again, together, think about what settings could be set um, and where decision making is still open in regards to virtue ethics. So that's it. Um, I have a bunch of references that were all part of the presentation. and. Um, either you can grab them at that little bit.ly or go ahead on Twitter and you'll find us. Um, but thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you all for coming. We will have further updates about the project. Um, <coughs> we are in the process of getting the vert.eu um, domain name, find us there, but for now, um, you'll find updates about the project and links to the project at the Ecos Lab website. So thank you so much. If you have any questions, we're here to talk. Thank you for coming.